Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. It's August the 5th here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm going to talk to you about the faith guide that's being offered by the human rights groups. Breakpoint.org recently posted an article to explain how a totally secular, liberal, and humanistic organization is setting out to change how people view church, how people view God, and how people view godliness. It's the Human Rights Campaign, and they have released their faith guide. Now, the Human Rights Campaign is our nation's largest and wealthiest ultra-liberal lobbying group. Only the most liberal politicians, show folk, activists are invited to speak at their gatherings. HRC's new guide is entitled, Coming Home to Evangelicalism and Self, and it purports to offer ways to help the LGBTQ people live fully in their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and to live fully in their religious, spiritual, and cultural traditions. I saw that headline in that opening paragraph, and I couldn't resist it. I, I can't be, I wanted to see how they did it. The guide says that LGBTQ Christians, quote, find it difficult to fully be themselves in their church communities, end of quote. One can only wonder why since the Bible stands firmly four square against LGBTQ and any other letters you want to put after it. It says they may have been taught that sexual or romantic relationships that are not heterosexual are sinful, only if they read the Bible. Yet those same LGBTQ people of faith, Christian faith, doesn't say it. It implies that. But these people of faith know deep within that they were born this way. Deep within they know it. No science. No empirical evidence on any level that this is natural. But they know it deep inside. Notice the wording here. They get to be fully themselves. Selfism. Not taught in the Bible. They know deep within. I don't know where this deep spot is. I guess I don't have one. No argument is made for any of this. No scriptural reasoning is given. Because the group, meaning the total, totally secular, humanistic, atheistic sort, traditionally care nothing for what the Bible might actually say or any other religious writings that don't match up with their philosophy. So right out of the gate, the pamphlet assumes what it needs to prove. It repeats the myth that people are nothing more than the sum of their desires. The guide explains the church is rejecting LGBT persons by requiring them to be celibate by barring them from leadership roles while they're in same-sex relationships and by not officiating at same-sex wedding ceremonies. The guide quotes somebody named David Gush Gushy, G-U-S-H-E-E, -E, I don't make it up, author of the book Changing Our Mind. Gushy tells the human rights campaign members that, quote, there can be no second-class Christians. Amen. A person who is a Christian is a person who has repented of sin and has been born again of the Spirit of God. Their sins have been forgiven. The Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in their heart and in their life and is constantly telling them, be holy 
as God is holy. Be holy. Don't do that. Be holy. <laughs> no second class Christians. There are people claiming to be Christian and not living at all the way the Bible outlines. There are Christians who are not living totally by the things the Bible teaches, in part because they don't know them all, in part because they still struggle with habits and things that haven't fully been divested as yet. It goes on to accuse those of us who hold to historic orthodox orthodoxy on sex of putting homosexuals outside the grace of God. You believe that? No group can put anybody, whoever they may be, outside the grace of God. It is by the grace of God that people are saved, and it's available everywhere. The HRC then explains how self identified LGBT Christians can change other people's minds about this issue, and they try. They insist that experiences, not biblical arguments, will persuade Christians on homosexuality. Experience will persuade the nuclear scientist that his theorems are all wrong because they feel that this is the way it works. It's the same idea. Words mean things. You don't get to decide what they are. All of this is true only because there are no biblical arguments for LGBT ideology. In the pamphlet, a woman who describes herself as a lesbian Christian, says she had an encounter with God, and he told her, You're gay. I made you this way. This is who you are. Of course, she was then shocked to find that her church wasn't buying any of it. She wanted, they wanted, she said they wanted to know how I could scripturally justify what I was telling them. They didn't care so much about this spiritual encounter I had with God. How about you? Isn't all that the same thing we ask of Mormons or Muslims or cult leaders who justify explicitly anti-biblical stances based merely on their experience? This is the pattern for religious cults of all sorts, and for secularists as well. Secularism has become a religion. Create your own religious values, create your own religious doctrines, create your own religious systems, and then find Bible words or concepts that hold them up, make them look real. Only in the case of all of these people, there isn't any. There's nothing in the Bible that supports the LGBT philosophy, behavior, or mindset. Isn't there? In fact, the Bible stands four square against homosexuality on any level for any reason. Even if you think God made you that way. It views this behavior as an affront to the God who made human beings both male and female. It views this as an attack against the God who established family as the basic building block of society. Family. One man, one woman, 27 children. It views this as undermining the very doctrines and practices so forcefully presented and illustrated throughout the Bible. However, for more and more people, even church people, the Bible is no longer the standard. I am told that there are over 900 Bible versions available today. I went online and looked it up. It's what it says. Why? Well, a percentage represent the different languages. That's reasonable. But the larger percentage reflect men's attempt to change God's work. Oh, to make it 
easier to understand. But then as you get down toward the, the bottom of the pile, it's not just making it easy to extend. They're changing it. They'll tell us it's about clarity. They'll tell us it's about the changing vocabulary of, of, of any English speaking, maybe around the world, it's the same way. Did you use the Revised Standard Version of the Bible? That was the first one that came out that was to make it easier to understand. Did you know that the men behind that particular manuscript, Westcott and Hort, were Bible deniers? They didn't accept the first three chapters in the Bible as being inspired of God. You don't have the first three chapters. You got nothing to build on. They did not accept the bodily resurrection of Christ. You don't have a bodily resurrection. There's no salvation. Dr. Hort did not accept the infallibility of Scripture. There's some things in there that probably just aren't exactly right. He also favored Darwinianism to explain human beings. Did I tell you they didn't accept the first three chapters that explains Darwinianism as hocus pocus? And neither men believed in, in an eternal punishment for sinners. No, annihilation. And they did not buy in to the vicarious atonement available in Christ that what he did is applicable to me. That one man could pay the price for another. I didn't believe any of this stuff. So what sort of a Bible would they create? Well, it's, it's largely the same as the old King James, except it's different in subtle ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's about the language structure and it's easier to understand. Did you know the Revised Standard Version is the version behind the American Standard Version? The New International Version? The New American Standard Version? The New English Version? The Jehovah's Witness Bible? A Bible called The Message? And a whole lot more. Does any of that matter? Well, your pastor, should he prefer one of these, will tell you no. That these Bibles are largely the same as the King James Version, which is faithful to the original manuscripts. And they'll have reasons why that's not so perfect in itself. Oh, and I believe the Bible to be God's Word, so... I will never go along with any of these alterations. However, using these versions can, could, will subtly influence your thinking about many key concepts. I was at a pastor's meeting where the speaker asked, which Bible do you guys prefer, the King James or the New International? Most of the guys were using New International. He, okay, we'll use that. And he chose a passage of Scripture. And in so doing, he went by another passage, a chapter in the Gospel according to John. I think it was chapter 8. And he said, oh, oh by the way, did you know <coughs> that in John chapter 8, I think it's chapter 8, the opening paragraphs, the opening concept in that chapter has a note at the bottom, has a little number or symbol at the bottom, and it drops you down in the book uh, to the notes to explain that. And in the explanation, you know what it says there? None of this exists. It's not in the Bible. How's that? And then he went on about his business that's the way it works 
I can show you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Douay version of the Bible. I have done that. Douay is the Roman Catholic version. But it doesn't make that version a good version of the Bible, meaning that it is faithful to the original manuscripts. Yeah, but nobody has the original manuscripts. Well, not in a completed form. But there's enough evidence available to indicate what they said as a result of history, in other writings, in written testimonies, in older Bibles. When people deliberately change the thus saith the Lord idea, they do it for a reason, and it's a human reason. Often it is nefarious. There's an underlying problem with it. You see, the issue here is biblical preservation, and it is a serious, serious issue because souls are at stake. When an ultra-liberal organization like the Human Rights Commission is trying to sell you on their commitment to God and to His Word, run, don't walk to the nearest exit. The walls about you are about to crash down upon you, and you will not see it nor hear it coming. 